Hello everybody, my name is Sven and I'm with uh, Chrome OS Platform Enablement. So we make new Chromebooks, basically. So this is a overview of where in the, you know, big forest of power in Linux that I want to talk about. Uh, I'm going to zoom in on this section. It's going to be about idle states, sleep states, more, more specifically runtime idle. So before we continue, I have a, like a little confession to make. We monitor dynamic idle states. Yes, we do. We monitor them and we track it. Why? Because they're important, right? So when we do platform enablement, we go through a journey. It's kind of a funnel. You know, you, you start with like a big tolerance. And then as time goes on, it becomes narrower and narrower. And we have to track it. And you're asking me like, why don't, aren't you just tracking the power? Why are you also tracking the idle states? Well, you know. Very important, even though, you know, you can meet your, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, you can meet your, your power uh, requirements. There could be, you know, if you're not meeting your idle residencies, you could be leaving power on the table or idle power on the table, right? So they are important. We have to measure them, right? So <clears throat> what this talk is about is the system that we use to measure them is currently like a patchwork. It's organically grown. Some of the things, you know, are in SysFS, some of the things are in DebugFS, some things, you know, are overlapping, some things are not there at all. So let's start talking about CPU idle states. So on ARM, that's relatively straightforward. It's like wait for interrupt, the CPU is off, the CPU is on, or it's asleep. It's nice and binary. On x86, we have these famous C states, you know, C0, it's alive, C2, C8, C10. We have all these different states, right? So then, you can say, okay, the CPU idle driver should track the residencies in SysFS. Why don't you go and look there? You can see what they are. Fantastic. Except two big things. Um, there's things, uh, <coughs> excuse me, there's like C state emotion going on. So the uh, CPU idle state can, uh, a driver can ask for a state, but the hardware isn't necessarily providing it. <coughs> excuse me. So it can do something different than what the driver is asking for. And that isn't reflected in the statistics. There's also a lack of atomicity because there's like a bunch of SysFS nodes that you have to read for all the cores. And if you don't all read them at the same time, you take some time to read all of them, well, time moves on. And it doesn't all completely fit together. So we had instances where, <coughs> excuse me, we had instances where we, uh, we didn't actually you know, we took a little bit of time to read them and the C0 residency actually turned negative. So in Go, we had to write like Go routines to try and parallelize it and try to read them all together in CPU idle to kind of get a decent reading out of it. It was all very complicated. So moving on from these uh, um, CPU uh, idle states is module idle, right? So that's um, on ARM, that's like cluster, sleep on, sleep, sleep off. Um, um, it, it fits really nicely in CPU, except that in x86 it doesn't, right? These are package C states, so that PC0, PC2, PC10. Um, now, these stats you can get through debugfs, uh, or you can get them through vendor tools. Uh, you know, some people here in this room might be, you know, familiar with TurboStat, <laughs> I suppose. Um, and there's also a CPI LPIT going on. It is not so fantastic because we have different debug FS formats. They differ between x86 vendors, even kernel versions, it differs, right? Now, when you go look at the, uh, the debug FS file, <coughs> excuse me, you will see that PC0 is missing. And that, again, that's a bit of a problem because when you're reading that uh, debug FS file, you know, you have to reference it against the time base. And the time base that the debugfs uh, file gives you is not necessarily the same as the one you have. So it invites all kinds of rounding errors. It invites all kinds of systematic errors that we, that we ran into, actually. Um, so um, so it, it, also what happens here is um, because these uh, going like taking these through debugfs doesn't work very well. Now we use like the TurboStat way and we go and we read them straight from raw registers, right? 
Now it invites duplicate implementations because we have an implementation for Go, we have an implementation for Python. There's probably a Rust implementation there somewhere that I overlooked. It's probably there. So now we go to the SOC themselves. Um, if I understand this correctly, uh, this exists on, on ARM. It fits very nicely in Gen PD, if I'm not mistaken. On x86, there, there, that's an, an S0IX state. Uh, currently, it goes from 2.0 to 3.4. So again, there are different levels. Um, again, we have to go through debugfs or the, de or, the, or the vendor tools. Going through debugfs, you know, it's also not so great because again, uh, it differs between x86 versions, uh, uh, vendors, and versions. Um, the the total time also is missing from debugfs. Again, it invites accumulating systematic errors. Um, and again, same problem. We have like duplicate user space implementations that are invited by reading those registers. Now, now we get to S2 idle, right? So with S2 idle, what we do is we repurpose these dynamic idle states for to implement a static system idle. So the idea is that we get comparable power savings and you know lower static res resume latency by doing that. Um, so the residency stats, they, they are read historically through like a patchwork of vendor specific paths. Uh, I believe recently Mario Limoncielo, he landed an improvement that actually happened before uh, this abstract was, uh, was created. So thank you very much for that. But there are quite a few gaps here, like how deep is the deepest reached idle state, you know, uh, um, we, you know, the main thing that we have that we see is we go to S0IX, we'd go to like suspend mode, static suspend mode, and actually we didn't get that. You know, we, either it hangs or it comes straight back and it didn't work. And then, of course, you have to figure out, okay, why didn't you get that? What was the, what was the dynamic idle that you couldn't reach and why couldn't you reach it? And something like that is not so, not so easy to determine because it happens in the field a lot. Like, okay, when it happens during platform enablement, we can catch it, we can debug it. Then we start seeing it in the field. And how do we de debug it? Well, you know, Intel throws a bunch of bits at us. So we get like a bunch of bits, fantastic. We send that to Intel, we say, hey, what do these bits mean? And we get something back, but it's not really scalable. We would like it to be a little bit better. So unfortunately, my talk is like very long on questions and, and, and very short on solutions. So number one question is the current patchwork we have, do we want to change anything there? Do we want to, do we want to make it like more generic? Do we want to make it more standardized? Do we include some sort of topology, you know, so that we have like one system where you can, you can read all these states and, you know, you really know what's going on without all these uh, interesting calculations you have to do. Uh, what about the special relationship to S2 idle? Is there a possibility there to add something that if your static uh, suspend doesn't work out and you didn't add, you didn't enter some some uh, runtime idle mode, you can actually see by looking at that particular subsystem. And again, also the output. How does that fit in? That's what I wanted to discuss. And um, I didn't just want to throw a patch set onto the mailing list. I thought it was far preferable to discuss this with you, highly esteemed gentlemen. Yes. You ask a lot of questions. I do. Um, what measurement interval do you care about? Like on those graphs, I don't think there was a y-axis. Um, it matters. Uh, so it's possible to go faster and faster such that you'll notice the skew more. Mm -hmm. If I ask for how idle was I in the last half hour versus how idle was I in the last microsecond, and it takes me a microsecond to read the counter, uh -huh. then one has a problem and the other doesn't. So depending on where you turn that knob, it's going to make it practical or impractical to measure. I see. Um, when I wrote TurboStat, the default measurement interval was five seconds. Um, sometimes it's used in on the millisecond range today. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, errors such as the one you refer to will creep up. You'll be like, well, 
how do you count C1 time? Well, on some processors, it's the non-idle, it's the idle time which is left over because it's not in any other counter and you add those up and it's possible to, to go negative, right? Mm -hmm. um, That's right. And so my question remains, what kind of granularity do you need? Because that will dictate the kind of solution you need. So what, what we do is we look at, um, you know, various system loads and, and various, uh, you know, use cases. And we're talking like 30 seconds, a minute, two minutes, five minutes, something along those lines. And we want to see every couple of seconds, ideally, we want to see what, uh, what the residency, what the idle Yeah, seconds is. should be easy. Should be, should be quite easy. Easy through what, through what uh, mechanism? Turbostat's pretty happy in the multiple second yeah. granularity. Turbostat reads the raw registers, right? It does. Yeah. So, so um, for that, we like the thing is like we then implement it in like user space. We have multiple implementations. Also, we have like big tables. Because... Let, let me address that part too. So, mm -hmm. um, it's been in fact we've had a, a prototype. Basically, what you want is atomic read of multiple counters at the same time without a system call for each one. And I think what we really want to do is extend perf to do that for us. So I, can, so I can give perf a list of counters and say, give me all these in one system call. Yeah. That's really the right way to do it. And yeah. then you can, you can put whatever tool you want on top of that. I think that's the right solution today. That sounds logical. Yeah. Um, and, and that would replace some of, the, some of the counters and some of the stats we have in the It would the replace the individual, individual calls to the MSR driver in, in our case, yeah. In fact, I mean, we already use perf for some things. It, it's just that it doesn't do this. We have to extend perf to do this. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. And, I mean, and reads are pretty fast. Reads in Linux are, are really quite fast. Yeah. Is, is perf, you know, as a subsystem, is it, is it quick enough to do, like, capable enough to do these things? You believe? Yeah, for what you're talking about, yes. Uh-huh. Very much so. Interesting, interesting. Excellent. Um, now, that, now, now, that said, some counters are just slow counters in hardware. And if you touch one of them, it's like, hey, see you 3,000 cycles later. That happens too. So you have to be aware of that. You could ask for a counter that's an expensive counter. And then, you know, what can you do? Can't go any faster than hardware speed. Some of them are fast. Some of them are not so fast. Mm -hmm. That's right. Um, like that, that uh, SROIX counter in the L pit, that might be a slow counter, right? That's out on, a, you know, maybe another chiplet. Um, yeah. Yeah, the, the LPIT counter is like a good example of the fragmentation we have, right? Because it's there on Intel, it's not there on AMD. Um, well, at least ACPI enumerates it. You yes. either have it or you don't. Yeah. Um, the hardest thing you've described is how to debug when you don't get SRIX. I concur with that. In the lab, we struggle with that in the lab. Mm -hmm. um, and so if that fails in the field on a system you debugged in the lab, it's like, now what? Um, there are tools you can get from us to run on that, but it doesn't mean that they're available in an end user system. Exactly. They're available to you, but maybe not to that user. Exactly. Like the thing is, we do things in the, we do tests in the lab, obviously, but once it goes out in the field, the scale becomes much bigger. And we I have, understand. we have, um, we see a, um, a, a greater granularity and a larger amount of failures. And we can, we can deduce much more from that potentially. If we, if we have good visibility of what exactly is going on, which is not so easy to do with a bunch of bits that we get from uh, syslog or... Uh, so I would say over the last five years of SROIX evolution, the trend is good. It used to be much more fragile. And now in current chips, it's actually pretty... It's not so difficult to get very good. You may even have runtime SROIX um, in PC10 residency, which before was unheard of. Yep. Today, it's like, holy smokes, you know, if you have a self-refreshing display, you're in PC10. It's like that was impossible like two generations ago. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, the, the trend is good, I guess, at least, at least from my lens. You may have conflicting information and I respect that if, if that's the case. Mm -hmm. Sorry? Hallway track. Yeah, hallway track. track. Oh, I thought you were saying something. Yeah. Hallway track. Awesome. Yeah, I, I just ended the session. Out of time? Yeah, out of time. Thank you so much, everyone.
yeah, this is this is it. Thanks for coming. Thanks for you know uh, content. Everyone who participated. Um, and hopefully see you next year. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.